Sylvia Plath began writing today's poem on September the 9th, 1956, during a stay in Yorkshire after her honeymoon. A year and a half later, in February 1958, it was accepted for publication in Mademoiselle, along with a poem of her husband's. Together, November Graveyard by Plath and Pennines in April by Ted Hughes earned the couple $60. Spring and winter on the moors is how Plath described their two poems. Birth and death, she said, or rather, reversing the order, death and resurrection. As well as a story of death and resurrection and of Plath's response to Yorkshire, today's episode will be a tale of two graveyards. The one found at St Michael's Church in Haworth, home to the Bronte family tomb, and the graveyard at St Thomas's Church in Heptonstall. From where the couple were staying in 1956, they could, in a few hours, walk across the moors to visit the resting place of the Brontes, and the poem's original title was November Graveyard, Haworth, giving us the strong impression that it was this graveyard that inspired it. However, many Plath scholars and writers, including my guest for today's episode, are convinced that the second graveyard, the one in Heptonstall, at least partly influences the poem. St Thomas the Apostle Church in Heptonstall is by contrast only a few minutes walk from the Hughes' family home. It is where Plath herself would controversially be buried, and where her grave is found today. Heather Clark, confident that Plath had this Heptonstall graveyard in mind, writes, She did not know when she wrote the last stanza of November Graveyard that she was contemplating her own burial ground. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Ear Read This, Edinburgh's most powerful book podcast. I'm Ash, your host, and today I will be talking about the poem November Graveyard by Sylvia Plath. On the last episode, we talked about Hardcastle Crags, another Yorkshire poem by Plath written a year or so after November Graveyard, and the two have more in common than just geography. Here is another stubborn scene of implacable Yorkshire stone, where pitiless realism banishes the fictive vein. We might be in Bronte country, but there are still no family-featured ghosts to be found. Since making that last episode, I've actually been able to visit where Plath stayed in Heptonstall and Hebden Bridge. In October, I was there filming events and recording podcasts as part of the Sylvia Plath Literary Festival. This was held to celebrate Plath's 90th birthday, and it was an absolute blast from start to finish. I had a fantastic time. I met uh, some incredible Plath scholars and writers and thinkers, not just people who were... Um, contributing or performing, but Plath fans and enthusiasts from all walks of life who had, uh, who had travelled there from all over the world. Met some great people for the first time. Also had the opportunity to meet up with some former guests on this podcast for the first time in real life. And as I said, I was filming, so there is a video kind of wrapping up the festival and going through uh, each event uh, on the way. If you are watching on YouTube, I'll use a few clips in this podcast to illustrate some of the points, because there is obviously relevant geography to talk about. Um, and speaking of the festival, that brings me on to my guest for this week, Sarah Corbett, who is a poet, novelist, lecturer, and she is also the reason the festival happened. Sarah lives in Hebden Bridge and was the director of Plathfest. She put everything together from scratch, and it's thanks to Sarah that I got to go and just have this amazing few days in, uh, in Heptonstall and Hebden Bridge. So I'm very, very grateful to Sarah, not just for coming on the podcast as I usually am, but also for this wonderful opportunity. It's easily the most exciting thing I've done as part of this whole podcast project. So thank you, Sarah. So on today's episode, we'll be talking about November Graveyard. As usual, in between sections of my conversation with Sarah, I will go through the poem line by line. And then on tomorrow's extended interview, we'll talk more about the festival as well as Sarah's own work. I actually have a copy of her uh, volume A Perfect Mirror here, which has a poem called Sylvia Plath's House. Very relevant for today's uh, uh, podcast. If you're looking for something in a Plathian vein with a similar kind of landscape, um, then I highly recommend A Perfect Mirror by Sarah Corbett. Make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to this on or watching and, um, and check out that episode tomorrow. To kick us off for today, I asked Sarah what made her choose November Graveyard to talk about. So I chose November Graveyard because it's the first poem where Plath explicitly writes about 
this area, this landscape. So that's the landscape of the Calder and Worth Valleys. So um, what we might think of as Bronte country, so Howarth, that kind of moorland, which then connects to what we might think of as Hughes country now, which is sort of Hepton Stall, Hepton Bridge. So um, yeah, that's why I chose it. But also I think it's, I think it's an immense sort of technical achievement um, at that point in her writing journey. So I think it's, I'm, I'm really interested in it as technically, as a sort of technical achievement. And I think you get a real sense of her kind of gift for mimicry and her ear and her attention to kind of orality and orality, so O-R-L-T-Y, A-U-R-L-T of poetry. I think it's also a bit of a satire. I think she's picking up on Yorkshireness, um, and it's a very particular, um, I know you're from Bradford Ash, so you'll understand it's a very particular part of Yorkshire, isn't it? The colder, sort of colder Worth Valleys. Mm-hmm. It's not really like anywhere else in Yorkshire. And I think it ha- probably hasn't changed that much since the 1950s. Other than you know the, the immense gentrification that you that we've had in Hebden Bridge, you know, and, and that kind of t- incredible toughness in the people, in the landscape, and also the sounds, you know, the kind of soundscape of that, and I think it kind of brings all of that stuff together, and I think it's it's a really clever poem. Did she? Uh, did what? What was Plath's initial reaction to to? that area did she take to it straight away well, did what it... we have I mean we have her journal entries and we have her letters the letters home to her mother and I think her very first response is it, kind of ecstatic I mean she talks about I mean she wouldn't you know she's never seen the moors really I mean the moors that we have here and she talks about the moors as being the closest to the ocean in terms of, you know, the ocean's been the most the most important sort of landscape for Plath. Um, and I think she just ha- she has this kind of full-bodied um, and psychic, what she calls her psychic landscapes, this kind of, you know, six senses response, I think, to the landscape and immediately sort of gets it. But I think her first response is very, you know, I think she's she falls in love with it in that first visit. And of course, there's the connection to um, Emily Bronte, you know, so they, I can't remember if they drive on the first visit or they walk, certainly at other times they will have done that walk from Hepton Stall across the moor, where even now there are paths, but it's easy to kind of get lost, you know, and sometimes, and she does talk about walking in this kind of tussocky heather. Um, it's about 10 miles as a crow flies, and they certainly have you know they certainly did that walk more than one occasion so she you can feel her exhilaration I think at that um in that landscape and at that landscape and I think also at that time on that first visit in 1956 you know she's still very very much in love with Hughes it's the beginning of their relationship and you know it's an encounter with with you know the the northern English you know which um you know, most people from America don't really get to encounter. So I think she has a kind of very full, rounded, um, intense um, response to the landscape. And I think she gets it straight away. And she gets the ambivalence in the beauty. You know, it's a kind of sublime beauty, isn't it? You know, in the sense that Mm. it's also terrifying. So November Graveyard has three stanzas of six lines each, sestets, and uh, here is the first one. For those of you not watching along on YouTube, I'm going to stop halfway through the last line, uh, so the sixth line, um, as the other half of it leads us into our second stanza. So here we go. The scene stands stubborn. Skinflint trees hoard last year's leaves, won't mourn, wear sackcloth, or turn to elegiac dryads. And dour grass guards the hard-hearted emerald of its grassiness, however the grandiloquent mind may scorn such poverty. So you can hear that northern gruffness straight away. It's blunt, it's alliterative, the scene stands stubborn. 
uh, lends itself all too easily to a, to a northern accent. I was, I was holding back as I read that. Uh, we talked last time on the episode on Hardcastle Crags about the kind of shared sounds in uh, Plath and, and Ted Hughes's uh, voice. And it's difficult here not to lean into more of a Ted Hughes sort of accent. Uh, there's a lot of Yorkshire vowels, dour grass. Uh, also hard to repress this natural northern sarcasm that I think is uh, lurking behind the, the end of it there. The uh, dour grass guarding the hard-hearted emerald of its grassiness, however the grandiloquent mind may scorn such poverty. Platt's really captured there the sort of gruff no-nonsense reception a grandiloquent mind, the mind of, say, a poet, might receive entering this stubborn scene. In fact, Sarah has written before about Plath's mimicry in an essay called Plath in Bronte Country, collected in the book Sylvia Plath in Context, which is edited by Tracy Brain. In November Graveyard, writes Sarah in this essay, the speaker is like a ventriloquist throwing a voice. And anyone familiar with the West Yorkshire accent, in particular that of the Calder and Worth Valleys, will hear the vowel-heavy foreshortening in a scene that stuns stubborn. Um, moving on then, skinflint trees, that wonderful word skinflint, meaning a miser, a, a, a scrooge. Although it doesn't quite say the word, you get a good sense of the meaning of skinflint from a bit of Dickens' Christmas Carol. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. So just as Scrooge hoards coal and denies poor old Bob Cratchit warmth, these trees are hoarding their last living leaves. And interestingly, Plath also uses flint at the start of Hardcastle Crags. You might remember it begins, Flint-like her feet struck, which sparks a flame that throughout the rest of the poem stands in as the subject's life force, her small flame that she's trying to keep, keep alight. So by calling the trees skin flint, there is a possibility that Plath is suggesting something more than the trees are just stingy, but they're actually sort of denying life by, by arresting the seasons. They won't mourn these November trees. They're in denial, in denial about the end of summer, but also perhaps implying that they won't mourn for the dead in this graveyard. They are like hard-hearted northerners at a funeral, showing no emotion. Neither will they wear sackcloth or turn to elegiac dryads. So sackcloth referring to hair shirts associated with grief or penitence. These were worn by biblical figures um, in the book of Esther, Mordecai wears a sackcloth and ashes upon learning that the Jews are to be killed. I think originally the sackcloth would be made from, from hair, sort of goat's hair or something, but later you find them woven from things like hemp or hessian, maybe burlap. Something uncomfortable is the basic idea, something prickly and fibrous. So visually it, it resembles the dead skeletal leaves that these November trees really should be wearing instead of last year's uh, glad rags. Perhaps Plath was thinking of Thomas a Beckett, who we discussed way back in the episode on T.S. Eliot's murder in the cathedral. Uh, Plath was, of course, a, a long-time admirer of T.S. Eliot, and she would probably have known that after his assassination, Beckett was found to be wearing underneath his, his vestments a, uh, a sackcloth or hair shirt. Now, St. Thomas's church in Heptonstall is named after St. Thomas the Apostle, who we'll come back to a bit later on. But this church was built in the 19th century, only after the church which had been there before was damaged in a storm. And this original 13th century church was the church of St. Thomas a Becket. So in the tale of two graveyards, does that maybe count as a point for Heptonstall? Possible Thomas a Becket reference? Don't know, might be pushing it a little bit. I'll let you decide. Uh, so elegiac dryads, let's move on to those. So dryads, tree spirits from, from Greek mythology who are known for their, their wailing and mourning. In Ovid, they mourn at the end of the story of Narcissus. They weep copiously at the death of Orpheus, the bard, and they uh, wear mourning regalia into the bargain. But, says Plath, these northern trees entertain no such spirits. Dower grass, that wonderful northern dower, um, it, this grass is hanging on to its last jewel, again like a miser, squirrelling away its heirlooms, it sounds. Uh, but this green is the green at the heart of the grass. I imagine uh, the last patch of green ringed in brown, or, or perhaps each blade of grass uh, is being on the turn with just a little green spine in the middle. 
and I love how the, the miserliness here is compounded by the dour grass guarding its grassiness. It's out for itself, this grass. It's proud of its roots. It reminds me of the uh, section in Hardcastle Crags where Plath repeatedly references black stone on black stone, the sound bouncing back identical each time, giving you the sense of extreme, uncompromising belligerence. Round here, a spade is a spade is a spade. Um, emerald is biblically associated with life and resurrection, but it's also a colour that Plath used to vividly describe the landscape around Heptonstall. She wrote in a letter of September the 11th, 1956, to her mother, Aurelia, I never thought I could like any country as well as the ocean, but these moors are really even better, with the great luminous emerald lights changing always, and the animals and wildness. I said emerald was associated with uh, resurrection in the Bible, and I guess this particular emerald might have a kind of ironic, uh, rather morbid play on resurrection. Remember, we are in a graveyard, so the grass is growing green on soil enriched with those who are buried in it. And finally, the grandiloquent mind scorns this poverty. The grandiloquent mind, meaning the, the poetic mind, the mind for whom these bare facts are not enough, for whom there needs to be something more to life than the poverty of this stubborn scene. And what kind of things that mind would look for is something we'll look at in the second stanza. Do you think um, this poem is, is as you, you, you sort of hinted, satiric, a bit, playing a bit with the, the kind of overkill of how hard-headed it seems? Or is it totally um, a disillusioning poem? I don't think it's a disillusioning poem at all. I think it's, I think it's a pagan poem. You know, I think it's, you know, confronting... I mean, there's two, it's always in Plath, isn't there? There's the two realities, you know, or the kind of the hard material reality, of, you know, of the stone and the earth and the skeletons. And then there's the, the other reality, you know, the next dimension, the fourth dimension of the ghosts. It's not a, it's not a Christian poem, you know, the saints, the saints silenced, you know. Um, it's very much a pagan, a kind of pagan vision an old vision I don't see it as disillusioning um I don't see disillusionment in Plath's work even at her darkest moments there is transcendence and I think you she's always moving towards transcendence I think so here we go stanza two uh, I will start from the uh, second half of the last line of the previous stanza no dead men's cries, flower forget-me-nots between the stones paving this grave ground. Here's honest rot to unpick the heart, pear bone free of the fictive vein. When one stark skeleton bulks real, all saints' tongues fall quiet. Flies watch no resurrections in the sun. Okay, kicking us off then. No dead men's cries, flower forget-me-nots. This refers to the supposed uh, etymology of forget-me-not flowers. According to medieval lore, a knight was picking his maiden some flowers, and depending on which variation you're reading, he either fell off a cliff or sank into a bog, threw the flowers at his maiden, shouting the rather unlikely phrase, forget-me-not. The idea that that knight might live on in the flowers that are named after his, uh, his phrase is obviously denied by this grave ground. Not just grave ground in the punning sense, a graveyard, uh, but with that grinding alliteration, we almost have this sense of sort of stone rubbing on stone. Reminds me of the uh, little bit of quartz grit we have at the end of Hardcastle Crags. And notice how the alliteration changes. When we're facing up to gritty reality, we have hard alliterations, paving this grave ground, his honest rot to unpick the heart, pear bone free. When one stark skeleton bulks real. Um, but when we're describing something that might spring from the fictive vein, from a grandiloquent mind, it's a soft alliteration. Flowers forget-me-nots. Um, hair bone free of the fictive vein. So grandiloquence, soft and fanciful. Reality, hard, grounded, uncompromising. Unpick the heart and pear bone free of the fictive vein. Wonderful, those bits, meaning not just rot away the uh, the softer parts first, obviously your organs and your blood, but also kill the romantic sense. 
kill any sense of, of romantic fiction. Unpick the heart might be, in another context, something a lover would say. I wish I could unlock your heart, unpick your heart. Here, Plath is putting a rather gruesome spin on that and talking about rot. So it's goodbye to comforting fictions, and not just romantic fictions, but religious fictions too. So when the heart and blood are gone, and the bones, the skeleton, bulks real, it silences all saints' tongues. Now she could mean literally all saints, but perhaps to fit the anti-resurrection message that's beginning to emerge here, the, the absence of any chance of life beyond rot, um, the saint in mind could be the angel that appears at the moment of death escorting Christians to heaven, who talks you through the mortal transition. That would be St. Michael, the saint after whom the Brontes Church is named. So re returning to our, our two graveyard scorecard, maybe that's a point for Haworth. Wider point of this part in the poem, though, is that no saint, Michael or otherwise, could offer you any comfort here. There's something particularly final about the graveyards in West Yorkshire. They're bleak, forlorn, rather gothic places. Sometimes it's hard to figure them as uh, sites of spiritual transition. No, the features of a West Yorkshire graveyard feel like instead they are conspiring to say together, good riddance. Finally for this second stanza, flies watch no resurrections in the sun. Flies are of course agents of rot. They feed on the dead, just like the grass of the first stanza. I mean, I guess I read, on one level I read a kind of encounter with uh, you know of the the kind of the American that kind of bright American world that she's come from with something much more essential um much older much darker um so that's where I read that it's kind of like you need to kind of this is a landscape this is a place and I do think November graveyard because it's often presented as oh this is the house graveyard was I've always read it as Hepton Store graveyard but actually, it's obviously poetic composite of both places. You can't look out across the moor from Haworth. Whether you could in 1956, I don't know, obviously. I don't think you necessarily can, but you certainly can at Hepton Stroll. Um, and, the, you know, it's going to assume that she visited there. I think November Graveyard, the poem, is a composite of two places that then becomes the graveyard in class poem. Um, I think it's this thing that she's going through where she's moving from something she's leaving behind and working towards casting off you know if you want to think of the fictive vein you know this kind of you know um very controlled almost contrived kind of american voice and she's kind of encountering something much more fundamental and of course in hughes She's also encountering that in Hughes. And of course, we know at that time, that early part of their relationship, that they are feeding and supporting each other's creative lives very, very intensively. So I see it much more of a poem about that, really, um, and about starting to shock off, you know, cast off um, this carapace, you know, that she's trying to shed an identity and confront something, you know, she's shedding a new world identity, confronting the old world. And I think, I think that's what's going on there in the poem. Okay, here is our third and final stanza of November Graveyard. At the essential landscape stare, stare till your eyes foist a vision dazzling on the wind. Whatever lost ghosts flare, damned, howling in their shrouds across the moor, Rave on the leash of the starving mind, which peoples the bare room, the blank, untenanted air. So the essential landscape, its features stubbornly resisting any additional dimension. Remember that grassiness of the grass. This landscape's out for itself. Foist, that lovely word, um, foist, this isn't just a, a rhyming synonym for hoist. When you foist something on someone, it is a thing that is unwanted. Uh, there's something wrong with it. It's fraudulent. Uh, so foisting a dazzling vision, uh, it, it is the uh, fictive vein in action. Your mind making things up and not for the best of reasons. Uh, whatever lost ghosts flare howling, that's uh, in the proper Bronte style, Rave on the leash of the starving mind. So these are not ghosts in the true sense, but delusions of our own making. There's a difference between believing in ghosts and believing that people see ghosts. And here Plath is offering a rational, perhaps 
gloomy explanation for seeing ghosts. They appear to us, or rather we create visions of them, we foist them on ourselves to placate the starving, uh, desperate need to know that there is more to life than honest rot. This is in keeping with the pointed failure of ghosts to appear in Hardcastle Crags. It also complements the ghost that does appear in another poem from 1956, Dialogue Between Ghost and Priest. Here, a paradoxically atheist ghost baffles a priest by telling him there sits no higher court than man's red heart. There is no afterlife, no hell or heaven, the adamant ghost tells Father Sean, only a kind of living death. Until the day of doom, a crock of dust is his home. One usual silver lining of having a terrifying ghost encounter is the somewhat spiriting news that there exists some form of afterlife. Not here, not in November Graveyard, where the ghosts are raving on the leash of your own starving mind. Which is reminiscent of a journal entry that Plath made after visiting Top Withens, the supposed inspiration for Wuthering Heights. In her journal, she recorded, disappointedly, the furious ghosts were nowhere but in the heads of the visitors. And in her poem, Two Views of Withens, Plath's narrator describes a luckier visitor who was met with white pillars and kindly ghosts, while the narrator themselves gets only bare moor and colourless weather, similar to the blank, untenanted air of the final line of today's poem. Strange, isn't it, that untenanted air, the blank untenanted air? It's explicitly saying there's nothing in it, and yet by using the word untenanted, it sounds haunted. It sounds like there should be a tenant there, like where is that person? Plath sort of builds up to that by having some of her line endings rhyme for the first time. So we have, at the essential landscape, stare, stare, uh, then whatever ghosts flare, and... Uh, in the last line, which peoples the bare room, the blank untenanted air. So we, we build up to this untenanted air and the, the, the rhymes that precede it give it a sense of, you know, echoing as if there is actually something there after all. And speaking of echoes, just as decomposing flesh becoming green grass is a resurrection of a kind, so traces of the past, echoes of the past, can haunt as well as any ghost. Gail Crowther, writing about walking in Plath's footsteps across these moors, says that it is always an odd experience, as I feel myself following the traces of two women writers years apart, Plath following Emily Bronte, and me following Plath following Emily Bronte. At the start of the episode, I quoted Heather Clark, writing that if November Graveyard is based on the Heptonstall graveyard as well as Haworth, Plath couldn't have known she was writing about her own future burial place. And there's actually a further biographical curiosity that adds a layer of ghostliness to the poem. Despite being called November Graveyard, Plath visited Yorkshire in September 1956, and then again at Christmas. But during November, she was actually in Cambridge. She wasn't anywhere near either graveyard that we've been talking about today. So her raving ghosts, the raving ghosts of her imagination, would have had to have been on a pretty long leash to be uh, tenanting themselves in the air up north. As my guest today, Sarah, has written in that essay I referenced earlier, it is the symbolic nature of the landscape that matters to Plath, how it provides a mirror for the inner workings of the self, the mind, the imagination, the psyche, and that deep self she was, in her writing, really concerned with. But one thing we see in this particular mirror is doubt. From the start, the landscape has been stoutly resisting notions of resurrection, along with other creations of the fictive vein, the scene standing stubborn, grimly real from the first line. Having debunked whatever lost ghosts are flaring across the moors, Plath seems to require some higher form of proof, something as solid as this grave ground. Which brings us back to Thomas the Apostle, from whom we get the phrase Doubting Thomas. It was he who refused to believe in Christ's resurrection until he had touched the wounds himself. Thomas the Apostle, as I said earlier, also gives his name to the church that was built after Thomas a Becket's was damaged in a storm, counting perhaps in the tale of two graveyards as a point for Heptonstall. I mean, a lot has been talked about and written about, you know, this kind of, you know, the, the death wish. And, you know, clearly she's confronting and has had me reason to confront death on a personal level. In her, you know, in her early in her early life, um, she only has an early life, doesn't she? Um, 
you know, she has kind of first-hand experience of it, I suppose, with her father dying and then, you know, a, a kind of suicide attempt when she's sort of 19. And also just her ability to go to the bottom, you know, um, in in her in her mind and sort of to to mine her unconscious in that way. She's, you know, she's looking at the dark, looking at the dark. And she's not afraid. She's not afraid. I mean, you know, you know, again, I do think there's quite a bit of tongue in cheek going on here. And perhaps, you know, perhaps there's also, um, I kind of read too much into it, but, you know, there's the kind of, you know, kind of things, the American Gothic tradition, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, um, poets like that, or, and even the Brontes, you know, there's a bit kind of echoes of that kind of, um, that kind of thing coming through. Does that um, staring at the dark, the become a kind of recommendation in the last stanza either or either a sort of to herself note to self or as a recommendation for other for others it feels a little bit like um again this might be right reading too much into it here but it feels a little bit like instead of these sort of comforting fictions that we've seen in the early in the first two stanzas she's sort of saying at the end you know stare at the essentials of of death until this other kind of vision appears Almost as if it's going to be, you know, superior to the, to the 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 silliness that she's sort of sending up in the first. Well, I don't think it's silliness, is it? I think it is a kind of, you know, the Yorkshire stereotype. But you know, I I've encountered people around. <laughs> You've got to be tough to survive around here, and mm. certainly at that time, you had to be tough. The winters would have been horrendous. There's a lovely Yorkshire phrase. I don't know if you've heard it. You know. Um, you know, you know, nine months winter, three months back end. Very much a colder <laughs> day, I kind of quote. What's the, you know, mm. the joys of global warming, the winter's now bearable. You no longer think, oh my God, the winter's coming in September. Although it's actually pretty chilly already. But, you know, 20 years ago, certainly, you know, when I moved here, people were saying, oh, you know, we used to be snowed in for six months. Um and certainly the, I've seen the effects of climate change here. So the winters are no longer terrifying and daunting, but they would have been in the 50s. And they were a tough people, were a tough people, you know, that kind of grit, you know. And it's millstone grit, isn't it, the, the rock. And I think she would have met that. She would have met that incredible toughness and grittiness. So I don't think it's a silliness. I think there's a mixture of respect, a little bit of sending up. But maybe that's a way of separating herself a little bit you know being able to step back from it and protect yourself perhaps from that I mean you you know she you she, has, she you know the foisting that foist is a very Yorkshire word as well is it to foist the vision are we mm. kind of trying too hard you know is she questioning her own kind of vision visionariness and I do think there's that play all the way through the poem of like here's something, oh, here's a little bit of maybe irony. It's going to sort of take the sting out of it. Um, and those howling ghosts in their shrouds, you know. You know, it's a bit of melodrama in Bronte, isn't there? More than a bit of melodrama. I think she's referencing that there. Yeah. And the blank, contented air, you know, you, I mean, apart from that, that it just creates a kind of strange feeling in you, that phrase, doesn't it? Because actually the air isn't untenanted. But it's that blankness, that space, which she was would have been experiencing quite intensively, that you get up here, you know, the kind of, once you're up on the tops, you know, the sense of air and space, that actually can be, something can come into that. And it's, she she touches on that in the next poem that she writes, Black Rock and Rainy Weather, this idea of, um, it's when you, you know, when you enter into what can seem like an open space, that's when something can come in. And that, in a sense, is the poet's mm -hmm. task, which is to become receptive to what appears to be untenanted, because that's when the visions come. That's when the, the dead speak to you, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I love that last line. And I agree. Foist stands out. Yeah. It, it was the first thing I think I noticed about the poems. Foist? Yeah. It's What's well. Foist doing there? <laughs> <laughs> and then you remember where she was and go, of course, that's what, that's what it's doing there. Yeah. And I think she, you know, and people forget this about Plath's her humour her dark humour and her irony and the way she's kind of undercutting that seriousness whilst she's mm. kind of saying something quite profound. 
Well, that's just about all we've got time for today. A huge thank you to my guest, Sarah Corbett. Remember to check back tomorrow for an extended interview where we will talk about Sarah's writing, both as a poet and a novelist, as well as this enormous project of hers, um, directing Plathfest. Remember as well to check back for uh, a video in which I'll show you some of the things we got up to at Plathfest, show you some of the contributors, and also just show you where Plath was. I took quite a lot of footage of um, some of the places mentioned today. I hope you've enjoyed that episode on November Graveyard, and until next time, happy reading. 